Mobile Suit Gundam, Kiro Senshi Gundam, or Gundam, however you want to pronounce the name, it's a franchise that without a doubt completely changed the face of the mecha genre by introducing super innovative concepts at the time. From a more complicated plot that delves in the certain tragic situations, to even a protagonist who is not perfect and a robot that is not invulnerable, the contributions that Gundam added to the genre are countless and iconic. And among them, one of the most outstanding is the mechanical designs of the Gundams. Because these robots, regardless of whether they are from an 80s series or the most recent ones such as Iron-Blooded Orphans, Unicorn or Narrative, you will always be able to recognize them, to a certain extent. And that's because all the mobile suits have followed an evolutionary line that began in the late 70s with the RX-78-2 the first gun. In case that you're not quite familiar with this franchise, don't know much about its history or just recently got into Gundam, then join me in this video where I'll do my best to tell the story of the design and style evolution of the Gundams and the reason behind the iconic mechanical designs of these mobile suits. One of the reasons why Mobile Suit Gundam is not so well known here in the West, and I know that it's somewhat famous now, but it's nowhere near Dragon Ball Z status of fame, but well, as I was saying, the main reason is because there have been many series since the release of the first anime, and those Gundam series that did reach to this side of the world, when they arrived, they were almost 10 years old, so the visual style and even the storytelling already felt old, so it failed to capture the new generations. The franchise began on April 7th of 1979 with Mobile Suit Gundam, and since the beginning, it transformed the world of anime because of its ground-shaking concept of the realistic robot and its military and warlike background but with a very human element in the foreground. In addition to its dated feel, another strong impediment to get into the franchise was the visual identity of the robots since almost all Gundams are very similar. And it's not like they are identical but there are very specific concepts that make the so-called Gundam robots a Gundam mobile suit. Among the things that always remain similar are the blue and white colors with highlights in red and yellow. In addition, the main Gundam show similarities almost equal to those that exist on siblings. Each one is slightly different and for someone who is not very familiar with them, they will surely look pretty similar. And that similarity is mostly seen in the faces, as there is always a mouthpiece with two air bends, two green or maybe blue or yellow eyes, and some type of helmet with a V-shaped frontal fin, the now famous B-fin. However, these design similarities between robots are not accidents nor laziness coming from the mechanical designers. All those mechanical details are completely intentional and actually come from the first design of the original Gundam, the RX-78-2, all thanks to history's first mechanical designer, a man named Kunio Okawara. It all started back in the 70s, thanks to Kunio Okawara, creator of the face that inspired all the Gundams. And well, for accuracy purposes, I must make it clear that the Gundam final product was a collaborative effort between many people. And the ones that stand out the most are Yoshiyuki Tomino, the writer and director of the series, and obviously Kunio Okawara, the mechanical designer. To clarify even further, mechanical designers are the equivalent of character designers but with robots and Okawara was the first one to receive that title in the credits. He says that the inspiration behind the robots was the suit of an astronaut, only taken to the extreme and turned into a robotic mobile suit. On the other hand, Tomino took his inspiration for the mobile suits from the power armors of Starship Troopers, the 1959 American novel. However, originally those armors or suits of power were going to be kind of a humanoid robot without a pilot. And the thing with that is that it would definitely not grab any attention from the children. This, coupled with the fact that initially Gundam was to be called Freedom Fighter Gunboy, was a recipe for disaster since we all know that in the world of cartoons and anime, a big chunk of money comes from the merch 
and gumboy figures based on a spacesuit or on a semi-robotic power suit were probably not going to sell very well. With that in mind, the idea then started to change and also, with certain grammatical freedoms regarding the words gunboy and freedom, Gundam was born. In this changing period is also where Okawara defined what would be the emblematic face for the future Gundams, a mobile suit that is directly inspired by the colorful and bright armor of the samurai, its beefing in the forehead and the mouthpiece to cover the lower part of the face. Specifically, Kunio Okawara decided to use the following design elements of the samurais for the creation of the RX-78 II, the world's first Gundam. The head, or at least the helmet that covers the head, would have a Chon Mage along it. This is a type of haircut that resembles a top knot above the head, something like the man bun but longer and closer to the head. In addition to that, the head would also be adorned with a metal or frontal crest with a V-shaped fin directly above the forehead. And since in the anime the robot was to measure about 18 meters or 60 feet, a human figure of that size with face and mouth was probably going to look very strange, so that's why he decided to use a facial guard or mouthpiece like that of the samurai to cover its face. And here is where things get interesting, the reasoning behind those design elements within the internal electromechanics of the robot. The V-shaped fin is actually an antenna, the two eyes are actually a pair of cameras that serve to faithfully represent the three-dimensionality of the terrain on the cockpit monitors. The red chin is a megaphone and also that part was painted red to make the robot look much more threatening. Also, another super characteristical design element of the Gundams are the two openings that appear in the mask, almost where the nose should be. These are actually a pair of air vents that are placed there to cool down the two Balkan guns on the sides of the head. Another curiosity is that in many of the Gundam series, you'll hear that the enemies refer to the main Gundam as the White Machine or even the White Devil, when in fact, the robots are sometimes more blue than white. The reason behind that is that Tomino originally wanted the Gundams to be white and grey, to give more realism to those mechanical titans. However, the sponsors said that those colors would not attract the attention of the children to whom the toys were going to be directed. So, the colors blue, yellow and red were added. So yeah, that now iconic color pattern of the Gundams is totally a byproduct of executive meddling. So now, with that information directly from the mecha designer of the first Gundam and the needs of the sponsors for the figures, it makes a lot of sense why the Gundams that followed are so similar. They all have some type of beefing on the forehead, the mouth covered by a mask with air vents and a somewhat helmet like that of the samurai. But, like everything, over the years the design trends have changed and the main Gundams have also been evolving. Some Gundams completely changed their appearance and others remained a little bit closer to the original. So let's check out the most radical or iconic Gundam design throughout the years. The second Gundam to appear is the Zeta Gundam, although chronologically within the series you can say it's the third. The very first thing you notice is the fact that this mobile suit gets rid of the red chin and the air vents. This Gundam has much more angular features and it could even be said that it has a more villainous silhouette because of the sharpness of its chin and its more triangular eyes. It should be noted that this was designed by Kasumi Fujita and Okawara only planned the transformation sequence, because yes, this robot can vary between the humanoid mode and the flight mode. This Gundam was a successor to the Gundam Mark II, which is essentially identical to the RX-78 II only with a different color palette. After the Zeta, the next mobile suit was the Double Zeta Gundam, for which the designers Makoto Kobayashi and Hideo Okamoto returned to the original concept of the red chin and the vents. Even though this Gundam's face is a little bit more similar to the original, Everything else is completely different, starting by the fact that the body is much more thick and bigger. This Gundam is formed by several parts and it also has a transformation sequence, but its main attraction is its destructive capacity, since it has a lot of weapons included and even one of its transformations is the mobile armor called G-Fortress. 
Later, for the RX-93 or new Gundam, they decided to put three vents on the mask and similar to the Zeta and double Zeta, a double B-fin. However, outside of those small elements, the mecha design is still quite similar to the original, only with darker colors in the blue parts and with very little red. The newest and most innovative part of this mecha is the addition of the fin funnels, those that can be used to attack and to defend. Even though the new Gundam that we saw on Char's counterattack is not that groundbreaking, in something like a parallel universe, the RX-93 is actually the RX-93 New 2 High New Gundam. This redesign by Yutaka Isubuchi really breaks a bit the mold of the original because, aside from incorporating a different color palette by adding violet, it also has a bulkier face and armor, and also the fin funnels are arranged in a different way and they have a much more wing-like appearance. This design was only seen in the novel Belter Chico's Children, and it is thanks to its differences with the new Gundam and the original that the definition of what makes or breaks a Gundam design was completely expanded. And just three years later, we would see the F-91 Gundam F-91 from the film Mobile Suit Gundam F-91. This film takes place 30 years after the events of Char's counterattack, and even though the mechanical design was made by Mr. Okawara, there are some differences that make the F-91 Gundam somewhat unique. First of all, the total size of the mecha is 15.2 meters, like 50 feet tall. That means that the proportions are smaller compared to the new Gundam, that was almost 75 feet tall. Also, at first glance, the face is very similar to previous Gundams, yet the differences become apparent once the mecha starts fighting since it can expel the mouthpiece to cool down faster. And again, the main colors are those of white and blue with some highlights in yellow and red. The other important difference is that the shoulder pads are much more bigger and they have three fins attached that can extend to help dissipate heat. It's very funny that within the story, the machine was called a Gundam since its face resembled the famous RX-78-2 Gundams. What follows is the Shining Gundam, the protagonist of the first Gundam anime that didn't belong to the canonical or main timeline known as Universal Century. This Gundam has the same colors as the original but in a slightly different combination. It also adds much more pronounced shoulder pads in much bulkier forms. The curious thing about this Gundam is that it has two forms, the normal mode and the super mode, and it is in the super mode where we see several new changes. The first important feature is the fact that the mask opens to reveal a completely red face without mouth or nose. We can also see that the helmet opens up and some yellow parts are raised. Those two changes give that Gundam an appearance that is much more similar to the super robots than to the real robots. Also, the shoulder pads separate and in general the whole body gets bigger. This Gundam is the first one to have two humanoid modes, the normal and the exalted. The second mobile suit to have that would be the Unicorn Gundam, but that mecha design will be developed more or less 20 years later. So far we have seen how, slowly but steady, the Gundams have been evolving and how some mechas separate more and others less from the RX-78-2. However, some elements of the original Gundam are always there. It was until more than 15 years after Mobile Suit Gundam that new Mobile Report Gundam Wing saw the light. This new series had a similar concept that was more or less explored in Double Zeta, but it was until now that it was perfectly executed. There was not one, but five main Gundams, and from the colors to the silhouette, each of them was quite different. It should be noted that all were designed by Okuwara, but this time the robots are much more stylized and colorful, and all of them have several circular and rounder details that make them look much more modern. Another thing to point out is the fact that each one has very particular and fantastic weapons, from wielding a sight or two enormous scimitars, going all the way to dragon-shaped arms and machine guns everywhere. But the robot that stood out the most was the titular Wing Gundam. That, as its name indicates, it has a pair of wings in the backpack that may be used to propel the robot and also they allow the Gundam to transform to a bird mode. In other words, a similar plane type transformation like the one of the Zeta Gundam. 
However, two years after Gundam Wing, the Wing Zero custom appeared in the film Gundam Wing Endless Waltz, and that mecha design definitely marked the era with its huge angelic wings and its silhouette more akin to that of a medieval knight in bright armor. The redesign of the Wing Zero was made by Hajime Katoki, and although he also redesigned the other four robots, the Wing Zero is still considered one of the best known Gundams to date. This new version of the robot completely changed the shoulder pads by making them triple and by discarding the bird mode transformation the wings got much more larger and they could even be used as a shield. Until that time, the Wing Zero Custom was one of the Gundams that deviated the most from the original model, but it still kept the proportion and some design elements that made it remain a traditional Gundam. Much more stylish, but traditional nonetheless. However, after Gundam Wing, the franchise would enter one of its strangest moments with Turn A Gundam, where the main mecha is almost completely different from what was established by the RX-782. The main mecha, called WDM-01 or System Turn A-99 Turn A Gundam, is super notorious because it's the first Gundam designed by someone outside of Japan. This robot was created by American artist Sid Mead, best known for being the visual and conceptual designer of Blade Runner and many other American science fiction movies. Mead designed the Turn A Gundam using a real-world aspect of industrial design in order to make the robot look more realistic and simple. In fact, his first draft of the Gundam was too exotic, so much that it was rejected to be the protagonist. But it was so weird that the design was kept and polished to be then used as the antagonist mech. The most curious thing about the Turn A Gundam is that although its proportions and colors are similar to other Gundams, its silhouette is completely different. Instead of having the V-fin in the forehead, it's located on the chin, making it look more like a super large mustache and therefore the air vents of the mouthpiece do not appear. Here is where we can really see that Kuni Okawara's design is quite emblematic, to the extent that if you change a small thing, as simple as the V-fin location, the outcome completely changes the essence and feel of the robot. There's even conceptual art of a redesigned Turn A Gundam made by Okawara and Katuki, where it seems more like a Gundam, but of course that was not seen in the series. To date, the Turn A Gundam is still one of the most alien looking main mobile suits of the entire franchise. A couple of years later, Gundam Seed and Gundam Seed Destiny would follow and their mecha designs and story return to the original and classic looks. In fact, the plot of Gundam Seed more or less emulates the tale of the original mobile suit Gundam and, to a certain extent, Seed Destiny to that of Sera Gundam. The Strike Gundam is practically a modernized version of the RX-78 II and later the Freedom Gundam is more akin to the RX-93 New 2 High New Gundam because of the wings in the backpack and all the available armor. It. But of course, the Freedom only has two air vents in the mouthpiece. Next, in Gundam Seed Destiny, the Impulse Gundam is similar to Camille's Gundam Mark II, but it adds the transformation sequence and the core block system of the original anime, known here as the Core Splendor. And after the Impulse, the new main robot would be the Destiny Gundam, a mecha that in its silhouette and colors closely resembles the Sera Gundam, but this one does not transform. And well, the freedom also comes back, only now it's called Strike Freedom, and for the most part it stays the same, just adding some gold highlights. The thing with these two series is that, in fact, these two Gundam entries can be seen as homages and tributes to the original series that had already aired more than 20 years ago. That's the reason behind their mechanical designs being very similar to those of the original series, with small changes here and there that appeal to a newer era, but in essence, very, very similar. We can say that despite being very successful Gundam series, they did not brought much evolution regarding Gundam design. As a matter of fact, for interesting designs we have Gundam 00, a series that stands out as the first one made for a widescreen format and that had a creative team that had never before participated in a Gundam anime. In Gundam 00, they returned to the formula that made Wing famous by having several main Gundams with all of them very different from one another. 
Exia, Dynamis, Curious and Virtue are the makers of the first season and well, as in all the Gundam series, then they would change. However, the initial robots are the ones that show the most modern and different silhouettes to the previous Gundams without being so extravagant like those of Gundam Wing. The Exia returns to the absence of the air vents on the mouthpiece and we can see that the whole face looks much more polished and neat with fewer square parts. The proportions are similar but almost the whole body is composed of rounder and angular parts making its silhouette look much more aerodynamic similar to what you can see with sports cars. The Curious has a jet transformation and a figure full of angular and pointed sections. The Dynamis is much more square and thick but that's because its specialty is long distance combat. But of course, the champion of thickness is the Virtue. To say that the Virtue is a big Gundam is a bit of an understatement and that is because that mobile suit is very big since it is made to stop airships and carriers and not so much to fight mobile suits. The other thing is that all that mega armor is merely that, an external armor to protect the Natalie, a much more slender and feminine looking Gundam that resides inside. Another interesting thing is that the Natalie seems to have long hair, but they're actually the cables that connect to the Virtue. For the second season of Double O, the designs changed to ones that were a little bit more traditional and blocky, and even the air vents for the Double O Gundam, the main robot, returned. However, the thing that stands out the most in this series is the fact that the creative team was not very familiar with the franchise and that led to quite some changes in the mecha design. And with that being said, we can clearly see that that helped a lot to innovate the ever-evolving silhouette of a Gundam. Ok, so to put things in perspective, by now Gundam is a franchise that has been around for more or less 30 years that has many series and spin-offs. With that said, the limits of what makes a Gundam look like a Gundam are getting quite expensive. Around that time, one of the most famous Gundams will arrive, to the extent that it even has its own real-size statue in Tokyo that replaced the original Gundam. I'm talking obviously about the Unicorn Gundam. This mecha has several interesting things to its credit. To begin, it is completely white with very few details in another color when it is in its Unicorn mode. Because yes, this Gundam has two humanoid modes. The Unicorn mode, which to be clear it's called Unicorn because of the horn that resides in the forehead, and the Destroy mode where the robot transforms and resembles a more traditional Gundam since the horn divides in two to form the biffin and the face is changed to one with the air vents and the two eyes. In addition to that, the internal psycho frame is rebuilt, which makes parts of the armor expand and bright and later green parts are made visible. Obviously, the transformation of the RX-0 is much more impressive than the one we saw more than 15 years ago with the Shining Gundam. In this series, we can also see the Vanshee, a Gundam very similar to the Unicorn, only black instead of being white, with highlights in gold and with a horn that features a lot more details. After Unicorn followed several series that were kind of as tributes to the whole history of Gundam and even the great phenomenon that are the Gunpla, the model kits of the mechas of the series. I'm not gonna talk about the Gundam build fighters or divers and I'm just gonna cover the basics of Gundam Age and Reconquista in G. You see, Gundam Age was a very ambitious anime that tried in the span of 49 episodes to capture all the feeling of legacy and novelty that once came with the Universal Century. The series is divided in three arcs that feature three main Gundams. The first one, called H1, is very similar to the granddaddy of all the Gundams, yet the gimmick of that series was the H system, which is a machine that collects combat data, learns and thus creates better weapons and upgrades for the robots. That's why later in the series we can see a couple of upgrades for the H1. The second arc features the H2 Gundam, which looks like a not so evil version of the Zeta Gundam, including its transformation sequence. Again, the H system made some upgrades for the H2 and we could see the Gundam evolve. For the next arc, yes, you guessed it right, we see the Gundam H3, which is more or less like a toned down double Zeta Gundam. That robot was also comprised of several vehicles and likewise had some evolution that led to the final mecha called the HFX Gundam HFX, a very long name for a not so impressive mobile suit. As you may have already figured out, this series was kind of a tribute for the Universal Century timeline, that's why we really don't see any weird or provocative mecha designs. 
Well, maybe you can say that the Gundam Legilis, which is an enemy mobile suit, kind of broke the mold, but it really didn't push the boundaries that much. Then we have the G-Self that appeared in Gundam Reconquista in G, which marked the triumphant return of legendary director and writer Yoshiyuki Tomina. But actually, the series was not so well received. The G-Self is a Gundam that has a very different face. Not as different as the Turn 8 Gundam, but it was a big departure from the previous designs. Instead of a P-Fin, it has two horns that protrude from its forehead. We then have two very big and yellow eyes and instead of the two air vents, we have a single vertical vent. The body is mostly the same, just with rounder edges and a lighter blue color, but it was the face style that really stood out in this mecha design. However, in 2015 came Iron Blooded Orphans, a Gundam series that completely changed the style and design for the mobile suits and expanded a lot the notion of what makes a Gundam robot be a Gundam robot. Here there are only 72 Gundams that hail from the Calamity War, a cruel war that happened over 300 years ago where mankind had to interface with machines in order to be able to defeat the atrocious menace that are the mobile armors. These Gundams have a much more brutal and harsh silhouette. You can even say that their outer frames looks like European medieval armors. Big, rough and heavy. The Barbatus is the main mecha and instead of a beefing it has a pair of golden horns that go all the way to the back of the head and the red detail in the chin gets replaced by a very pronounced red and sharp chin that almost looks like a beard. The shoulder pads are rounded and large which gives it a very wide upper body and it gets even more inhuman since the robot has an almost non-existent waistline as the upper and lower body join only in a beam. Also, the legs are much more animal-like from the knees to the feet, with even having hooves instead of toes. Needless to say, in this series laser weapons are ineffective, so all robots choose to bring swords, axes and maces, making the fights much more brutal. Then we would see the Gushin Rebake, a Gundam that's also super bulky and big that has four arms and an integrated shield. But it's in the second season where we can see that the new designs stray even further away from the RX-78 II. By the way, my favorite design is the Barbatus Lupus, but the next evolution is even fiercer. The Barbatus Lupus Rex has four horns, big yellow claws and hooves, and even a tail that can be used as a weapon. The Kimaris Bidar has drills that come out of its knees. The Gushin Rebake Full City still maintains the four arms, but it is now armed with a pair of giant pincers. And then there's also the Flowers, or Yusei Go For, which is a Gundam that transforms and has a pair of railguns mounted on its shoulders. This series was quite controversial at the time since it had a very different look and feel in its Gundam design and the fans didn't want to accept it as a Gundam series. What many people argued was the fact that the Barbatus and all those mobile suits were just Gundams in name, since their form was too alien from the previous Gundam designs. However, it should be noted that the classic elements are still there. The human-like proportions, the air vents in the mouthpiece, the V-shaped fin, the red chin and the white, blue and yellow colors for the main robot, only portrayed in a much more radical and exaggerated way. So to wrap things up, what can we take from all of this? That is that regardless of the mecha designer or the context of the series, at least one of the main Gundams will always include all or some of the graphic elements of the original Granddaddy Gundam. And that's because it's a fairly simple and distinctive design that over the years has become the symbol of these robots. It doesn't matter if it's an almost identical but modern clone like the Strike or one as bizarre as the Barbatos, each and every robot that carries the name Gundam has something that makes it possible to trace their evolution from the legendary RX-78 II. Clearly, with a couple of elements of traditional Japanese past and some primary colors, Kunio Okawara and his crew completely redefined the silhouette of real robots and now that shape is a worldwide icon of Japanese anime and popular culture. Gundam is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary and I thought that it would be nice to have a look at its past and see how much the style and design of the robots has changed throughout the years. And well, just to clarify, I did not analyze every Gundam ever, not even enemy mobile suits. I mean, as it is, 
this video is a little bit long, so talking about every Gundam was totally out of the question. As I told in the beginning, I try to limit the robots to those that are the most iconic or the ones that introduce the biggest mechanical design changes. But if you think that I missed a Gundam, you can go ahead and leave it in the comments and I'll try to do my best to answer you. And also, I am not a Gundam expert nor I'll pretend to be one. As a matter of fact, I started in this franchise with Iron Blooded Orphans and then worked my way all the way to Universal Century. So yeah, by now I have watched a lot of Gundam shows since I really liked the franchise a lot. And if you're wondering who am I, my name is Absa. And if you want to continue the conversation about Gundam and many other things, you can follow me on Twitter where I tweet in English and Spanish and also on Instagram where I upload pics of some of my cats and my figures and sometimes even myself. This is a new channel where I'll be going to talk about anime, comics and even some figure reviews mostly the machinations and gumba. So I invite you to subscribe to this channel and as per YouTube algorithm, click on the notification icon. Thank you very much for staying to the end of the video and without anything more to add, see you soon.